Hello, I'm Michael Glick, editor of the Journal of the American Dental Association. With me here today, I have Dr. Bruce Pilstrom, our associate editor of research. Dr. Pilstrom, I would like to ask you a couple of questions, follow-up questions, from a conference that was held here at ADA in October of last year. Sure. First, uh, from a genetic and genomic perspective, what's the difference between Mendelian disorders and complex diseases? And could you maybe give me a couple of examples of each? Sure. Um, well, first of all, we need to talk a little bit about the uh, genomics and, and, the, and what genomics and genetics really is. Let me give you a little bit of background, and I'm going to use a little prop here. I've got two combs I just pulled out of my pocket, as you can see, and let's imagine that this is a DNA helix. And it's much more complicated, of course, but the essential thing is we've got a sugar phosphate background, and then we've got these nucleotides that match up with each other. Cytosine match matches up with guanine, and thymine matches up with adenine. This is, the, you know, there are about 100 teeth on these combs, on these combs and the comb's about six inches long. Now, in our genome, there are three billion of these so-called nucleotides that match up with each other. And if we were to extend this, these combs, let's say this was a DNA helix, this would stretch from New York all the way to California. That gives you an idea of the size of three billion base pairs. Now, if you look at the illustration here, you can see that the helix is entwined around each other. So it's, and that's how these match up. So it isn't a simple straight molecules on each other, but they're entwined as, as they go around. Now, the thing about it is, is that there are these single nucleotide polymorphisms. That is, these bases that match up with each other. In some people, you may have a thymine. In other people, you may have an adenine. And these differences occur between people about every two to 300 of these base pairs. And these are called single nucleotide polymorphisms, or SNPs. And these are associated, can be associated with various diseases or disorders in the genome. And people do studies to look at the associations with various diseases. Now, the other type of uh, uh, thing that most people are familiar with are Mendelian disorders. And most of us in dental school or in pre-dental school or medical school, we learned that Mendelian disorders are inherited either as a dominant or a recessive gene. And we're talking about one gene here, a very small number of genes, not all of these SNPs. And an example of that, for example, if the, uh, in the illustration, which illustrates a, re a recessive mode of inheritance, would be sickle cell disease where, as you know, people who have sickle cell disease develop anemia because they have these sickle-shaped red cells that are a result of a single gene mutation, and this genetic variant causes the, uh, the cells, the red blood cells, to be sickle-shaped, and it affects the hemoglobin so that they have anemia, these cells die earlier, and so forth. Now, for the example, with uh, more complex diseases, such as periodontal disease and dental caries, maybe cardiovascular disease, certain types of cancers. These common complex diseases are not single gene disorders. They're disorders that certainly have, a, for example, with a, a, a periodontal disease and caries, we know from twin studies of twins raised together and twins raised apart that there is a prominent genetic component to both periodontal disease and caries, but there's also a very prominent um, environmental component, certainly sugar with dental caries and with sm smoking with periodontal disease and dental plaque with both of them. And these have an, a large environmental component. So the fact that you may have a genetic predisposition, it's not from a single gene or even a small group of genes. It's, it's from your, the whole that a group of genes interacting, and maybe many hundreds of genes interacting with the environment, and the environment can be an overwhelming factor in whether or not one has these, gets these diseases. Thank you, Dr. Pilstrom. Uh, presentation at the conference certainly distinguished between using genetic tests for disorders of Mendelian inheritance patterns and employing genetic tests for more complex diseases. Sure. 
What's the role of genetics in each of these two situations, and how does this affect the clinical usefulness of these type of tests? Sure, that's a really good question and a really important question and something that was emphasized at the conference. First of all, as we discussed, Mendelian disorders or diseases are associated with it, caused, they really are caused by a variant in a specific gene or location on our chromosomes. Um, where, uh, in, as an example, there was a, uh, an example in the uh, conference that was presented on a gene called AXIN2. Now, this gene causes oligodontia, or missing teeth, congenitally missing teeth. And if people have many missing teeth, many missing permanent teeth congenitally, it's possible they may have this single gene disorder. Now, what's really important for a dentist to know about this is that if we have a patient that has oligodontia with a lot of missing teeth, permanent teeth mainly, they have missing teeth, you might want to consult with a physician and have a genetic test done or get a genetic test done to see if they have this AX, the AXIN2 gene. Because if they do, it's possible that they may be more susceptible to colorectal cancer because this this is an example where the missing teeth are associated with colonorectal cancer as sort of a syndrome. They occur together. So you, these patients then, depending upon you know, the interaction with their physician and so forth, and their physician's advice, may want to get tested more frequently or screened for colonorectal cancer to prevent the occurrence of that in the future. Now, the other issue is for complex common diseases such as periodontal disease or caries or you know heart disease if you will they're currently that now this is where you're shooting you're looking at the whole genome they're complex diseases that involve and they're common diseases that involve many many uh, different genes that interact with each other and also the epigenome that is on top of all this that is the environment effect on the genome so it becomes very complex, and it's not one specific uh, gene that you're looking at. Now, there are companies out there that are offering tests for common diseases. Uh, you know, as a, as a consumer, I can go online, and I can take a bit of saliva, and I can send it into a company and have it analyzed for many different diseases. And I'll get a report back that I may have some gene or some genetic loci that's associated with uh, some diseases. That does not mean by any means that I'm going to get the disease. And this is where it's, it's, it's important to understand the difference between single genetic variants and complex diseases that, and common diseases where you have many different genetic effects with them. So, and there are also tests available, and they'll become increasingly more available for dentists to determine whether or not perhaps their patients may be more susceptible to disease. Currently, everyone at the conference agreed that there is no genetic test that can determine susceptibility or progression of either periodontal disease or caries. We're just not at that level quite yet. So with that in mind, uh, where do you see genomics in the future, how it can enhance patients' care? In <laughs> well, <industry>? well I've <laughs> anybody who tries to predict the future is wrong. <laughs> Having said that, though, uh, my prediction is that if I, if I were forced to predict, which you're doing, but if I were forced to predict, I'd say there's a couple areas. One is that with a lot more research, someday we might be able to determine whether or not a patient is more susceptible to one of these chronic diseases like caries and periodontal disease. Or if they have it, maybe it'll progress faster. We're not there yet. The other thing, it may be oral cancer. Certain types of oral cancer, maybe that will be the situation where we could uh, use genomics to predict response to oral cancer treatment or even maybe dictate certain types of treatment that would be that person's cancer may be more susceptible to precision medicine on the basis of genomics. Now, some things that probably might be more likely and more immediate would be whether or not uh, a patient is more likely to react positively to the use of an analgesic. Uh, we know that some people react better to certain analgesics than others, and some people have no effect from them. This may be related to this genetic 
predisposition that they may have and genetically related. So these are just a few examples, but again, who, you know, who can predict the future? And before any of this, at least in dentistry, is used, there needs to be a lot more research. So based on what was discussed at the, at the conference, what initiative do you, would you suggest ADA should support in this emerging discipline of genomics and genomics and dentistry? Sure. I, again, that's, uh, I, there, there are lots of initiatives that could be supported, but first of all, I think it's important to thank the American Dental Association and the Task Force for Design and Analysis and Oral Health Research for co-sponsoring the, the task force. As um, many people know and some people don't, the task force and the ADA have had many, many years, we go back over 40 years of collaboration with one another. And the fact that both of these organizations partnered together to co-sponsor this, I think is a reflection of the importance that both organizations put on this and, and trying to you know, make sure that the profession both researchers and educators and practitioners that we all are aware of this is here the future is now and it's going to be ever expanding as we go forward so i think as you mentioned in your in your editorial that accompanied the march issue the summary that mike michael barnett and i wrote the genetic tests can be used they can be misused and they can be misinterpreted and it's important that practitioners and the public understand that uh, they understand what genetic tests do and what they mean. Uh, so we avoid some, try to avoid some of the confusion. Now, in this regard, I think, in my opinion, what should, the ADA should do is to support two initiatives. One, I don't know if they're initiatives, but support two uh, activities. One is to strongly support the use of uh, genomic education and genetic education in our dental schools because the future dentists are going to be faced with uh, lots of uh, genomic tests that may be marketed that are coming out. Their patients are going to be asking them about the genomic, the results of their own genomic tests. They may get a test that says they're susceptible to a specific oral disease that they've obtained on their own on the basis of sending in a saliva example, a sample to a company. So the dentist needs, dentists of the future need to be able to interact with their patients. Also, dentists are going to uh, need to, they're going to be, there are going to be lots of tests that are marketed. There is going to be lots of applications in genomics in the future, most likely. And so the dentists need to know the background of this. So they'll need continuing education, which is the second thing I think that the ADA could be involved with and promote. So it's genomics in uh, dental school and it's genomics in continuing education for practitioners. And I think uh, in respect to this, I, I attended a conference just a few weeks ago at the National Institutes of Health and it was really an eye-opener for me. One of the people who um, was there and who's been a leader in this area is Dr. Thomas Hart. Now, Dr. Hart is the uh, director of the Volpe uh, Center for Research that is uh, funded by the ADA Foundation. It's located in Gaithersburg, uh, Maryland at the National Institute of Standards. And he has been very active in, uh, in genetics. He's one of the few dentists who have formal training in genetics and genomics. And this group that I, that I attended at NIH, there were representatives from the American Dental Association, the American Dental Education Association, the uh, American Association of Dental Research, uh, as well as representatives from across medicine, including physicians, the American Heart Association was there. Uh, there, were, there were nurses, there were pharmacists there, and it was a very inclusive group. And the purpose of this group was to work together to try to enhance genomic practice as we move forward and to bring this information to all of our practitioners because they're going to have to collaborate one with another. Dentists are going to be collaborating with physicians for you know, those diseases and disorders that affect the oral cavity, which are genomic, have a genomic basis or a genetic basis. And I think, to me, that was a wonderful example of the collaboration that can occur under those situations. And it was wonderful, and it's, I, I, I hope that uh, 
all of these organizations I mentioned will become involved uh, with this as we move forward. Thank you, Dr. Pilstrom. It was very enlightening, and uh, thank you and Dr. Barnett for writing this wonderful summary of the conference. Thank you. It was a pleasure.